So good morning, everyone. I see that uh, people are joining uh, little by little. So welcome to this, uh, this webinar from the CMCC series. This is a webinar uh, introduced by the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. At the same time, it is a, a webinar which is promoted by an Horizon 2020 project, which is COACH, co-designing the assessment of climate change costs. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Francesco Bosello. I'm professor of economics at the University of Venice, Cafoscari, and I'm also the coordinator of the COACH project. So let me first share the screen and give you a little bit of background of what we are going to uh, see and talk today. Okay, so as I was saying, this CMCC webinar is also promoted by the COACH project. Um, the main focus of this Horizon 2020 project, which is going to end next uh, November, is to improve our knowledge on climate change um, impact and costs. And what we are going to uh, discuss about today refers to a very peculiar issues issue raised by climate change which are tipping points and in particular we are going to discuss social economic tipping points which are something different from the catastrophic events we are probably used to uh, our speaker unfortunately we should have uh, had three but one of our colleagues uh, is ill i cannot uh, could not make it but Anyway, we have two uh, excellent sp speakers, Predrag Ignashevitz from the Institute for Environmental Studies, Free University Amsterdam, and Nina Knittel from the Wegener Center for Climate and Global Change uh, in, in uh, Graz University, Austria. Um, before giving the floor to our speakers, just uh, let me briefly, for those who are not uh, uh, used or are new to this uh, webinars uh, series, uh, introduce very briefly uh, what uh, CMCC, the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, is and does. Uh, CMCC is a multidisciplinary research center with uh, the aim to improve the knowledge of all the multidimensional aspects of climate change. Uh, so the physical sciences, but also the, the social economic aspect related to this uh, uh, global phenomenon. It is an Italian research center, is a multi-division or multi-office research center, which is spread all over Italy. And here you see our offices, where they are. And uh, I'm talking from the Venice office currently. There are 11 research divisions and uh, you see the spread of uh, the scientific fields that are covered. So multidisciplinarity and cross-disciplinarity is at the base of uh, CMCC research, going from uh, hard sciences and physics to uh, economics and uh, uh, risk assessment. Uh, we try to cover all the multidimensional aspects of climate change. So you, you see the nine core topics that uh, we are uh, treating here at the Institute. In addition to research, we are also uh, investing a lot in dissemination and outreach of the uh, academic uh, and scientific results. As, uh, we try to, uh, let's say, bring the knowledge that we produce to the widest possible audience. And this webinar and the webinar series are one of the tools that we try to use to uh, improve the spreading of all the knowledge and the scientific outcomes that we are producing. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping rules. Uh, while uh, the presenter are going uh, to uh, give their speech uh, in, 
uh, you can raise questions using the Q&A section of Zoom. So we are going to give precedence to the uh, question that are written. I'm collecting them and will then redirect them to the, to the speakers. Uh, but anyway, at the end of both presentation, and uh, the webinar will last more or less one hour. So we have a, a 15 to 20 minute presentation for each of the speaker. There will be the Q&A uh, session. The written question will have some precedence, but also you are welcome to raise questions if you are not too shy, but please, uh, well, you are very welcome to do this in person. Just raise your hand and we shall give you the floor to ask directly a question to the speakers. Just before asking the question, uh, briefly introduce yourself, just name, uh, surname and what you're doing. Okay. And with that said, just my last duty is to recall that uh, this uh, uh, webinar series is uh, uh, recorded. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, you can find more information about the coach project uh, visiting uh, the coach website. You can see it uh, on, on the screen. And of course, many more information about CMCC are on the institutional website, www.cncc.it. Uh, let me just introduce the next webinar that uh, incredible to say, but will be as interesting as this one. And it will be on ocean and cryosphere, just to show the width and breadth of the um, uh, topics that we are addressing addressing usually with this uh, uh, series of webinars. So I think I spoke too much already. So with, without further ado, I'm just stopping the screen and give the floor to Predrag, which is our first speaker. Predrag, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, sorry, can everyone hear me? I think hopefully you can also see my yes. screen. Uh, yes. Well, hello everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Predrag Ignacevic. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Environmental Questions, uh, which is an institute uh, dedicated to uh, tackling questions of climate change and the environment at the Free Institute of Amsterdam. And I have to apologize in advance for any background noise because i'm in a very small uh, rural hotel in uh, in the mountains of montenegro currently so uh, uh it's quite pleasant but also uh yeah it's quite small so uh, it's just just a warning in advance um so what i would like to talk to you about today is um the time of emergence of economic impacts of climate change um and during my time as a phd student at the institute uh I've mainly been working with uh, a model that predicts or projects the impacts of climate change. Uh, and then we try to put some monetary value to these impacts. So we, we try as, as good economists to say how much climate change is going to cost everybody. Um, and we wanted to this time take a slightly different approach. We realized that uh, maybe giving monetary values to these extreme uh, consequences might not always be the, the best way to go about things. Uh, but we would also like to find a measure which uh, would really focus specifically on these extreme events. So the moment when climate change really reaches a certain tipping point, when, when these consequences become really, really severe. Um, and so that, uh, let me see, can does this work? Yes. So that's, that's uh, the focus of, of today's uh, discussion. Um, in, in, in particular, we're dealing with uh, the so-called integrated assessment models of climate change. And if you're not familiar with these kinds of models, they're used very frequently to advise uh, policymakers on uh, how to tackle uh, the questions of climate mitigation and climate adaptation. 
but very frequently we're using indeed some monetary estimates to to tell people how severe climate change is going to be but what if we ask the question would climate change impacts be worse than the 2008 uh, economic crisis for example or an oil crisis or for example the global pandemic uh, if we have ways of monetizing these different impacts we should be able to compare between them and say at what point would climate change really be worse than for example what our economies have experienced in the past 50 years um, so that is the challenge that we took on in our uh, latest paper and this is not really a completely new idea. Um, climate scientists have already used the concept of time of emergence to determine at which point, for example, the temperature change uh, will exceed some historical bounds. Um, uh, I think now you'd be able to see the full screen, sorry. So you would, for example, ask yourself at what, what is the date when the impacts of climate change in any particular area, for example, Germany would exceed some very, very high percentile of the past economic shock. For example, the 2008 crisis would be considered a very severe event. So we would track the year in which our model pro projects climate impacts, and we'll be able to tell you, okay, this would, for example, happen in 2055 or maybe later. And all of this, of course, depends on the choice of the climate and the socioeconomic uh, model and data that we're using to feed our model. Um, yes. So what is our method of approach? So we're using a relatively novel uh, integrated assessment model called Climrisk. And what Climrisk is very good at as a model is we're good, it's good at predicting uh, damages at a very local scale. So Whereas a lot of these models uh, that try to estimate impacts of climate change work on a regional or even global scale, we're trying to make these impacts very local. So more specifically, this works on a half by half degree scale or approximately 50 by 50 kilometers around the equator. Um, and we're dealing with the time horizon of between a year 2010 up to 2100, so the 21st century. And we can also use several different RCP uh, scenarios which are used to uh, uh, which are using these models to to tell us how temperature will evolve over the the coming years uh, and that also sort of gives a signal of how how big climate mitigation uh, in place is so all of these things are enter our model and we are then essentially projecting how big these impacts are on a very local scale and all we're doing is comparing this to, to historical impacts. So essentially uh, economic damages in the past and how, uh, at what year would this essentially be exceeded? And we call this the time of emergence of economic impacts. What is also interested about, interesting about the Climrisk model is that we can also take into account the urban heat island effect. And the urban heat island effect is uh, a very specific phenomena that occurs in urban areas where the local temperature in a city is expected to be much higher due to various factors such as uh, the infrastructure, the traffic, uh, and general population density that all contribute to a, a much faster uh, evolution of climate change in cities. So given that our model is very local, we also uh, uh, can account for these local city effects. And our expectation is that in cities, this time of emergence uh, would happen much quicker. So very, very highly populated cities with, with a lot of economic activity uh, could be at risk already, potentially. So maybe to move on to, to some interesting results, we always tend to make these uh, nice looking maps with a lot of, uh, a lot of dots uh, and, uh, and more specifically, these very red areas indicate uh, highly populated cities, in this case in Europe. And in this figure, what you're looking at is on the left, we have a, a very high mitigation scenario, the RCP 2.6 scenario, which would mean that we are abiding by the Paris uh, Agreement. And on the right, we have a very fossil fuel driven development. Uh, so there are very contrasting extreme cases of, of climate mitigation policy. 
and we can see that uh, that the time of emergence uh, of impacts would occur uh, in the coming century if nothing is done about climate change. And more importantly, they would, if this would happen much faster in the urban areas. So in Central and Western Europe, many cities could also already experience this effect around the year 2040. But if we're looking at the uh, RCP 2.6 scenario on the left, we see that barely any areas in, in Europe would experience the time emergence in the, coming, in the current century. And this also has to do with the fact that climate mitigation would mean that temperature change will at some point um, uh, towards the end of the century really, really uh, 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 reduce. So we, we're not going to get any more uh, severe damages. So the economic impacts would never be exceeded. Uh, the past impacts would never be exceeded. We can, of course, do these for other areas uh, in the world as well. <clears throat> in this figure, you can see that uh, India, which has a lot of economic activity and population density in the north, could even experience the time of emergence uh, in the northern area, even with uh, climate mitigation uh, being uh, as desired by the Paris Agreement. But if nothing is done, of course, uh, we see that India is one of the most affected countries in Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia, and that many, many areas would, again, experience the time emergence of impacts in the first half of the century. It is also important to mention, I think I forgot to mention that, that this is a very, this measure is very dependent on the local economic history. So when we're comparing these future impacts uh, to the past impacts in a particular region, we are looking at what were the past shocks of that country. So for example, if a country really had severe economic uh, shocks in the past, uh, I would take here the example of China, uh, which had a, the great famine uh, in the years 1960s where quite a significant portion of the GDP or the gross domestic output was lost. Uh, that is quite a severe effect that climate change has to exceed. So therefore you're seeing that with our measure, China does not appear to have a, a very, very high risk, but this is also just an, an artif artifact of, of, of our modeling approach. So the measure of time of emergence. And finally for the US, uh, we can see a very similar story to Europe. So under the RCP 2.6, we are uh, uh, essentially seeing no, no exceedance of the past economic shocks, uh, very possibly due to the uh, economic crisis of 2008, which uh, affected uh, the developed world uh, significantly. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, of course, uh, uh, many areas would experience the time of emergence by year 2080 or 2090. And of course, cities uh, much earlier than that. And finally, we can also zoom into particularly uh, as cities in the world uh, and in Europe. Uh, and we can sort of plot, uh, plot in, in a single figure, uh, the difference between uh, different cities and also the, the time of emergence of exceeding particular shock thresholds. So, for example, as a policymaker, you may not be interested in the exceedance of the most severe past shock, such as the economic crisis, but maybe you're interested in at what point would climate change be as severe as some average median economic shock in the past. So we can really plot this for, for many different uh, economic shocks. And as you can see, uh, as these shocks become more severe, uh, it is more, more difficult for climate change to exceed these shocks. So you're getting a very upward sloping uh, a figure. And at some point, if the shocks in the past are so severe, uh, you would not uh, realistically exceed these shocks in the current century with climate change. Uh, but this is just an example of a, of a nice way to compare between different uh, cities and also different, uh, different shock thresholds. So maybe the, the main point to highlight here is that this model that we're using, Climrisk, is very flexible in, uh, in uh, really uh, comparing between different climate policies, different economic shocks, and also different geographic areas. So um, in that sense, it's a, it's a very uh, flexible integrated assessment model. So maybe uh, I can sort of conclude shortly uh, what we've discussed. So we can see that unprecedented impacts of climate change uh, could be experienced in many areas around Europe, 
particularly in uh, cities. Um, and this, the same goes for the, uh, for the US. And uh, you can, of course, zoom on many different areas. And, and we can see that really climate mitigation does uh, delay these risks significantly. Uh, and in, in many cases, by several decades. So you can almost see this measure as the measure of time of emergence telling us what is really the, the, the time frame for potential adaptation. So how much time do we have before, uh, before climate change becomes so severe that we are not sure uh, what the implications of this would be. So those are the tipping points we're talking about frequently. Uh, and we can see that, of course, with the Paris Agreement, many areas in the world uh, would never even exceed these past economic shocks. Uh, which is uh, which is good news and something to obviously strive for. And this measure, like many other, uh, most other research, also supports this this claim. Uh, and again, to highlight, of course, that applying this climate mitigation, so really following the Paris Trade Paris Agreement uh, and and steering clear of the fossil fuel development, would buy us time for climate adaptation. Should severe effects uh, of climate change uh, 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 start happening more and more often as we uh, as we pr uh, proceed into the 20, 21st century. Uh, so that is all from uh, from my side for the presentation. I'm really looking forward to uh, to the questions in a uh, fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Frederick. Uh, we have already some questions that we are collecting in the in the Q and A. But before answering them and uh, addressing them directly, I would like to uh, give the floor to Nina for her presentation, and then uh, we are uh, we are collecting all the questions and have uh, I think a, an interactive uh, Q and A session at the end. So. Uh, anyway, very interesting, uh, and I have also some ideas for the communication of results <laughs> uh, that I will share with you afterwards. So, Nina, please, the floor is yours, and we are looking forward for your uh, presentation now. <clears throat> okay, thank you. You should see my screen now. Yes, correct. Yes, perfect. Okay, and I, yeah. Great, so thank you very much. My name is Nina Knittel. I'm working at the Wegener Center for Climate and Global Change at the University of Graz. And I will present a piece of work that we have undertaken together with colleagues from the Institute for Environmental Studies at the Free University of Amsterdam. And uh, it's about macroeconomic assessment of flood risk under different insurance market systems. And this has been motivated also by previous work in the COACH project where colleagues found that um, climate change can lead to socioeconomic tipping points with respect to, to insurance markets in, in some EU regions. I will first give you some context. Um, my slide. Okay, so I will first give you some context. We'll then present you the research questions that we ask um, very briefly, the methodology, and then some hopefully interesting results and conclusion. So to the context, uh, we speak about flood risk. So river and flood risk is expected to increase in many parts of the EU as a result of climate and socioeconomic change. So on the one hand, climate parameters that are relevant for flooding, such as precipitation or temperature, are expected to increase in uh, frequency and intensity, increasing flood risk. But on the other hand, also socioeconomic change is a very important driver for flood risk with increasing GDP and wealth, also increasing the exposed assets uh, to flood risk, also with settlements in, in areas that are at risk from flooding. Uh, with respect to the relevance, flood risk is also among the most important impact types for European regions. This has been found by studies that undertook um, comprehensive impact assessments looking at different impact channels. So it's a relevant and increasing risk and we have to think about how to handle this risk or how to deal with it. And effective adaptation 
besides the more classic, say, um, flood protection walls and dikes, um, includes also insurance. And insurance provides adequate financial compensation for individuals that experience flood damage. However, the design of insurance mechanisms varies significantly across EU countries. And this has implications for the insured parties or the households, but also the insurance provider companies and also the public household who may need to step in in case of um, insufficient coverage. So all these factors together put growing pressure on insurance markets with a potential need for reforms. So more recently, the discussion in the literature has moved towards the design of an insurance against natural hazards with a special focus on risk sharing possibilities. So the current flood insurance systems in EU countries can be broadly classified into these three classes which we are also going to investigate later in the macroeconomic assessment. So the first class is a voluntary or a semi-voluntary system that has risk-based premiums, private reinsurance and a voluntary uptake or for the semi-voluntary system, uptake is required for a mortgage. So this is in place in the majority of EU countries at the moment, which means that there is um, premiums are rather high because they are fully uh, risk reflective and households can decide whether to, to ensure against flood risk or not. So the, the uptake is also rather low. Um, the, second, the second class of systems is the solidarity system, which is currently in place in France, Belgium, um, Spain and Romania. And this has a mandatory uptake and no premium differentiation. So each household pays uh, the same, no matter his uh, individual or household level risk. So no matter where he lives, it's kind of a tax, so to say. And then third, there's the public private partnership currently only in place in the UK, which has a mandatory uptake, but premiums are only limitly uh, risk-based. So they are risk reflective, but there is an upper limit to how large they can be. And there's a public reinsurer who covers the most extreme portion of risk. And uh, Tessa Leid Al, so our colleagues at the, at the IBM Institute for Environmental Studies have shown in a partial equilibrium analysis, and I will also shortly introduce this model, um, that unaffordability of insurance becomes a significant problem in certain areas due to climate change and that existing insurance markets can disappear in some areas due to the high prices and the low demand for coverage. And they also found that implementing policy adjustments, such as a higher degree of risk sharing, uptake requirements, or a public reinsurer can reduce um, these problems. So from the literature and also this partial equilibrium analysis, uh, we find that some kind of risk sharing is uh, superior to other mechanisms and especially to the voluntary system. And we wanted to find out whether this holds also in a macroeconomic setting. So considering um, macroeconomic feedback effects. So the first research question is what are the macroeconomic implications of flood risk? And we look into the future, into um, 2050, considering a broad set of of socioeconomic and uh, climate scenarios for different um, global climate models. Secondly, we want to see how these macroeconomic impl implications can be improved under policy changes, investigating different insurance market systems and also recognizing the role of different actors. And uh, finally, we also looked at which system yields the lowest overall costs for the EU. Okay, so as to the methodology, as I said, this is gonna be um, brief. This gives you um, a conceptual overview of the model chain from emission scenarios to the macroeconomic analysis. So if we start from the left, um, we use data for a set of um, RCPs, so uh, representative concentration pathways, different climate scenarios, um, together with different climate models. Um, that provide data on temperature, precipitation, potential evaporation, which are then used in a hydrological impact model called GLOFRIS, which then determines changes in flood risk 
um, that is used in the partial equilibrium model, the DFI model, which I will talk about in a second, and also directly in the macroeconomic model, uh, the coin int model, which I will also present. And we also consider different socioeconomic scenarios, so different potential um, developments of, of the economy. Sorry. So the dynamic integrated flood insurance model, the DFI model, is composed of a flood risk model that um, determines flood risk for NUT2 level regions, which are then used in an insurance sector model to calculate uh, premiums depending on stylized insurance systems. So these three systems that you can see on the right hand side, uh, as I introduced earlier. Um, and these premiums are then used in a consumer behavior model to determine in a first step whether insurance is affordable, so depending on an uh, household income threshold. And second, if affordable, whether households take up insurance and adaptation measures will depend on expected utility maximization. And then the outcome of these uh, sector, the insurance sector model and consumer behavior model um, are used in the macroeconomic model, which is a CGE model. And these uh, parameters are premiums for private households, so the size of the premiums, reinsurance premiums, incentivized adaptation action by insurances to get lower premiums, and insurance market penetration rate uh, together with the associated uncovered risk. So one slide on the uh, macroeconomic model. It's a global CGE model, so a computable general equilibrium model, which implies zero profit conditions for all economic activities associated with level for these activities. It also implies market clearance conditions for all commodities and factors associated with the price to these commodities and factors. And it also implies income expenditure balance for the representative agents. In our model, we depict the world economy as 26 regions with a focus on EU regions. And each consists of 20 sectors and two representative regional households. So we have a private and a public household. This figure shows um, the consistent flows, the closed system of flows in the CGE model, where we on the left-hand side, we have the regional household, which is endowed with labor capital land resources, which it supplies to the domestic production. And domestically produced goods can be either exported or together with imports from other regions, they form um, the Armington aggregate, which is then supplied on the domestic market and can be either used um, as intermediate inputs in domestic production again, or uh, as final demand for the regional household. So now we get to the results. And the first question was, um, what are the macroeconomic implications of flood risk in 2050 uh, with the current insurance market system for each region? And we depict here the changes in GDP, private welfare and public welfare as percentage difference from a baseline without flood risk in 2050. It says it for a worst case scenario. So considering this scenario combinations with we have, this is the worst case, but it doesn't make a qualitative difference if we look at other scenario co combinations. So on the left hand side, this is the UK with the public private partnership in place. Then we have France, Belgium, Spain, and Romania with the solidarity system. And then the other regions, I think the first are self-explanatory. And then the five last regions are aggregates of two or three countries, the Baltic states, Northern EU, Northeastern EU, Southeastern EU, and Southern EU. And note on uh, welfare, this can be understood as uh, changing consumption possibilities. So if you think of the public household and its consu consumption possibilities, we have to keep in mind that this is also very relevant for the private welfare, for private households, as public consumption is often used for the provision of public goods. Um, the differences in the effectiveness of the regions very much reflects the direct damages of um, flood risk in, in 2050. 
So flooding also depends very much on um, current adaptation standards and protection standards, which are lower in low income households, uh, sorry, low income regions such as Romania or uh, Poland and also Southeastern EU, including, the, uh, including Hungary and Bulgaria. And lower impacts in, for example, Netherlands um, or the UK. And then the difference between private and public welfare reflects how governments handle um, uncovered risk. So whether there is a high compensation rate, so whether uh, governments issue compensation payments to affected households um, or, or not, or the, the private household has to cover um, damages itself. So for example, in Southeastern Asia, but also Poland, and Italy, there's a high compensation rate for these um, uncovered risks. So governments pay compensation payments to household. In contrast, for example, the Netherlands or in the Baltic states, there are no such compensation payments and the private households have to cover uh, un uncovered risk themselves. So then we wanted to know how these indicators change if we assume a different um, insurance market system. And as um, suggested by the literature and the partial equilibrium model, privatary, private voluntary systems are um, not the way to go. So we look into public-private partnerships and solidarity systems. So if we assume now public-private partnership or a solidarity system in all regions simultaneously, we see here the percentage point difference from the baseline insurance markets for all regions. And a positive value indicates an improvement over the, the initial system. So for the first five countries, there are no big differences as they had a PPP or solidarity system in place also in the baseline, except for an improvement of government welfare uh, for those systems with the solidarity for those regions with a solidarity system when they move to a public-private partnership which is due to the reinsurance premium that is paid to the to the public household to cover this extreme portion of risk for the those regions that have a private voluntary system in the baseline both a ppp and the solidarity system imply an improvement over the current systems. And whether the improvement is larger for the private welfare or the government welfare, again, depends on how um, the government handles um, compensation payments in, in the initial system. So as we saw earlier for the Southeastern EU, Poland, Italy, the improvement for the government welfare is much larger as there is no uncovered risk and therefore no compensation payments needed anymore. In contrast, as we saw for uh, the Netherlands and also the Baltic states, the improvement for the private welfare is much larger than for the government welfare or public welfare. Um, there are many details we could look into, but I also wanted to show you the implications for um, the public budget. So. With the lower economic activity, also the tax base is reduced. This effect is particularly strong for the factor tax with less factors employed in, in production. And this implies that tax income for the public household decreases. And together with this de decrease in income, a rise in compensation payments, as it usually is in place in, in voluntary systems, um, this intensifies the pressure on public budgets. So lower income, higher expenditures, um, increases the pressure on public budgets. Eventually, we also looked at the overall costs of insurance market systems at the EU level. And here I just show you the different scenario combinations. And as you see, it's not a big spread. And we also see that the GDP effects are rather insensitive to changes in insurance market systems. So it's not a question of how the economy in total is affected, but more of um, a burden sharing question. So is it the private or the public household that uh, bears the costs? And for both private and public welfare, both um, 
uh, alternative insurance market systems are an improvement over the, the baseline systems with private welfare tending to be least affected in the solidarity system and public welfare tending to be least affected in the public private partnership also driving the overall um, welfare effects. And to conclude, we have seen that increasing flood risk represents a challenge for economies in 2050 and the macroeconomic consequences vary with the underlying insurance market systems. A higher degree of risk sharing among different actors can reduce this overall macroeconomic cost, which, which has been also um, uh, suggested by the literature and is also in line with the partial equilibrium analysis. We have seen that GDP losses are relatively insensitive towards the choice of insurance arrangement, but as I said, it's more a question of burden sharing and the welfare indicators do reflect um, this burden sharing question. For the EU in total, the macroeconomic costs are lowest with a public-private partnership, followed by a solidarity system and has the highest costs in the baseline scenario, so where each region maintains its current insurance market system. So no engagement in insurance activities may seem as the cheapest option in the first place for policymakers, but there are additional expenditures when households are insufficiently insured because prices of premiums are too high and the, the demand is low. And there is some kind of social safety net in place to prevent households from moving into poverty. And finally, our results are clearly valid from a modeling perspective. Um, however, there, there are some limitations, such as we assume a frictionless move from one insurance market system to the other. Um, there are institutional framework, con uh, framework um, conditions and, and also questions of political feasibility. So we want to inform the debate on different approaches to climate change adaptation with a special focus on flood risk for a broad set of climate and socioeconomic scenarios. Yes, um, that's it. Thank you very much. And I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you again, uh, Fredrag, for the interesting presentation. We had a lot of questions. I, I saw that uh, while you were presenting, Nina, uh, Fredrag started to uh, write uh, his answer to the, the people who uh, raised the question. So uh, ju just uh, um, first, uh, given that many of the questions that were raised to uh, Fredrag were related to the way in which uh, the clean risk uh, model accounts for climate change damages because uh, uh, many of the questions were which kind of damages are included how they are translated into an economic uh, uh, an economic evaluation which kind of uh, um, uh, so how a specific impact can be attributed to climate change given that some of the impacts are like floods or droughts could also become uh, uh, occur independently upon climate change so just if you can very briefly recap this question because they're very very hot topic and so many many ask this and a question for both of you which is the uh, again, you, the usual one uh, one million dollar question how can we or how do you include uncertainty in all these uh, evaluation and how this can be uh, communicated to stakeholders so predrag first and then the, the question on uncertainty for both yes yeah, so I've, I've already tried writing a little bit about the about how how the climate model works fortunately the the original climate paper was published uh, I think uh, last week or two weeks ago. So I can also link that uh, where it goes into detail about how exactly these damage functions work. Uh, but very briefly, we are uh, relying on the RICE model damage functions, which translate temperature change uh, into direct economic damages. Um, and this is sort of the work of William Nordhaus that he already started with the original DICE model. Um, and this does also include sea level rise, 
uh, but we are. It is very bad at, at really focusing on these specific uh, specific events, a specific flooding or natural disasters. These extreme events are not really explicitly modeled with these uh, quadratic simple quadratic damage functions. Uh, but but the shapes of these damage functions uh, are quadratic, so as to capture the uh, these are try projecting a little bit how these extreme events might really spiral out of control but it, it, they don't really necessarily uh, look at individual events so this is something that we consider still a kind of a downside of, of clear risk and something that we're looking into improving in uh, actually in our recent work with uh, with cmcc um, uh, we're really trying to 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 make more local damage functions uh, and potential in the future also account for for these specific events. Uh, but I think for more information, I, I will also link uh, link some of the literature. Okay, Ina, if you want to go with uncertainty and then play drag, and then th that we have a, lo a lot of questions for Nina too. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so to the uncertainty, um, there are many dimensions of uncertainty and we try to cover as many as possible. So for example, we um, account for uh, different climate scenarios. So this is one type of uncertainty, RCPs 2.6 to 8.5. Um, we also uh, use data from different global climate models, so general circulation models, which especially for precipitation, so relevant for flooding, do diverge quite a bit. So we also use data from different climate models. And then third, dimension the socioeconomic development uh, as socioeconomic driver is also important for, for flooding. We also account for this uncertainty. And then there is also the economic modeling uncertainty where we um, do sensitivity analysis of all the parameters that we have um, in the model. And I think it's very important to communicate this. Um, it's always a challenge to communicate this to policymakers um, who are not very familiar with maybe the models um, and also these approaches. But yeah, I would say we always try to be as clear um, and honest about the uncertainties as, as possible. And I think this is also uh, one goal of the project in general. Yes. Uh, prayer, do you would, would like would you like sorry to add something on the uncertainty yes and, so uh, it's 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 kind of similar to nina's story it's something that that uh, uh, we're also doing pretty well hopefully in clear risk so the the goal is to have a relatively simple to run model which can account for all for many different types of uncertainty so this goes for uh, climate uncertainty so we can run the model for many different rcp scenarios but also specific INDCs, so we can really account for, for example, what if the US does not abide by the Paris Agreement or what if, what if uh, China doesn't do that. So we really try uh, having a wide, uh, uh, wide climate uncertainty range. Uh, and we're, we're, uh, we also use a range of climate models uh, based on which, uh, which are, uh, well, temperature, local temperature patterns our model maybe it's a topic for another another time or also you can also read in the paper uh, and as far as the socioeconomic uncertainty we can uh, run our model for many different ssp scenarios uh, and i think there was also a question for adaptation so that's not something that is accounted for in this baseline sort of clim risk uh, model but it is something that we're actively working on uh, with our clean risk extensions, which relate to river flooding. For example, we can account for different uh, kinds of river flooding adaptations. So for example, if the, if the uh, adaptation is done in an economically optimal way, or if it's kept at the exact same level, we can account for this type of adaptation. And same goes for, uh, for heat adaptation, which is our most recent uh, work with clean risk. We can also account for, for different levels of, of adaptations to heat uh, so uh, 
uh, yeah, this is also something we're trying to communicate in, in, in our work, but it's of course a bit difficult to decide uh, what are all what scenarios specifically the policymakers are interested in, and uh, yeah, what how to really present this in a in a very effective way. So maybe if someone has an idea, it can also be shared. Okay, and now uh, Nina, up to you because we have we we have uh, many questions also on the insurance. Uh, presentation. So uh, let me try to summarize a little bit because I try to compact them. Uh, first of all, something that I note also is that uh, it seems to me that there, there, there is not that uh, huge differences uh, across uh, the different uh, schemes, insurance schemes, in the sense that, uh, yes, indeed, uh, welfare uh, and cost uh, are changing, but uh, I mean, uh, we are within uh, the, the one, two, three percent compared to the base, uh, the base case. So, uh, one question is perhaps uh, here we have uh, some issues of scale because uh, insurance is very local. When when you work uh, at nuts two or a larger level, then something could. Uh, uh, could uh, I mean this averaging effect could hide some um, some uh, larger differences? So what do you think about this? And another question on insurance uh, is uh, uh, if these three different uh, uh, approaches to insurance that you are modeling uh, are providing, or can you tell? something about how they provide different incentives to prevent uh, uh, to prevent the damage because uh, uh, some uh, someone uh, from our audience says that uh, perhaps uh, there could be also uh, some perverse incentive to take less uh, precautionary uh, attitudes or behavior because there is insurance so uh, do you do you do you see with the, your study and your results so, some differences in providing the correct incentives to to the, the insured to take also precautionary measures or not? Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for the questions. Um, so to the first about this uh, aggregating effect, this is a very true. So if we think of our scale, we look at regions, sometimes it's countries, sometimes it's also two or three countries uh, aggregated. And we only consider uh, flood risk in, in 100 year flood plains. So for those households that are most at risk uh, from, from flooding. So clearly <laughs> these impacts that we kind of put into the model are rather small. So we do have flood impacts that are, um, yeah, depend on, on the, the size of the economy, but then the changes in the insurance parameters. So changes of the, the size of the, of the premiums and compensation payments, these are rather small. So that's why also the macroeconomic outcomes are rather small. Still, we think, um, we do see differences that are in line with the with the literature. So um, and also uh, given the the scenario combination set, we do see these differences. So it's not a, a random uh, result in that respect. Um, also, uh, with respect to this question, we look at expected annual damages. So if we would look at the like a hundred year event, this results would also change very much because in the expected annual damage case, um, the insurances always uh, cover all their expenditures, right? So the, the premiums always make up for, for all the, the damages. So this would also change very much if we consider a larger event, for example. And then with respect to the uh, incentives, uh, this is probably more a question to those who um, did the DFI modeling, but what I can say is uh, that uh, some systems do provide incentives for adaptation. So, for example, if we think of the solidarity system, where each household pays the same no matter its personal risk and also no matter what it does, there is no incentive to, to actually undertake adaptation measures. Whereas in other um, 
insurance market systems, this element can be implemented. So premiums can be lower for those households that undertake um, adaptation actions, such as wet flood proving or dry flood proving, like moving your stuff from the basement to the first floor and so on. But in general, yes, this uh, principal agent um, issue is, is very relevant in, in um, insurance discussions also with respect to, to the public household. So if the public household is um, not the one covering uncovered risk, it might be reluctant to undertake public adaptation measures such as um, construction walls and yeah. Thank you. Okay. Just another question for the both of you. I, I see that Predrag is uh, is writing a, is a compulsive answer to, <laughs> to to our audience. Just a, a general question that can be addressed to to both studies. So of course we are taking and we are trying to project uh, or to find uh, uh, insights uh, in a, a sometimes a far distant future. So how are we taking into account the evolution of societies? Also, for instance, uh, for the, the possibility to pay insurance uh, and uh, how to consider if uh, there is some uh, uh, autonomous adaptation in our scenarios and uh, eventually if we are using some discount rates so how do, do we consider the, the intertemporal dimension so this is a question that can be raised to both uh, to both studies just to give an idea to our to our audience and this will be also the last uh, thing question because we have three minutes to go <laughs> who want to start first nina please <laughs> So um, for our model, for our economic model, I should add it's a static model. So what we look at is um, uh, two different states in 2050. So um, these developments towards 2050, towards the future, um, are based on exogenous uh, parameters, so on the literature um, as to how CO2 prices are going to be, for example, uh, GDP in the different regions, uh, population and so on. And then we construct a uh, economy in, in 2050, uh, which we then um, shock, so to say, with the, with the um, flooding, flooding or, and, and the insurance parameters. So the, oh, we only look at the changes between these two potential states in the future and clearly there could be a better way to to represent the future but we are very limited uh, in that respect to to available data thank you nina predrag one minute <laughs> yeah so i uh with regards to adaptation i have to say we're quite uh, uh we're still not not that uh, uh, uh prepared to, to account for it, especially the, the autonomous adaptation. The Klimisk is, is a model that, that, although it does try to pro pro project damages on a very local scale, it does so in a very uh, kind of a brute force manner. And we're trying to really work on, on this to really expand on uh, uh, and, and, and really use the local scale adaptation. But th this is still something that we would need to potentially team up with, uh, with, uh, with other people who, who know a little bit more about this than, uh, than, uh, than we do. If you have ideas, maybe we can, uh, we can have a separate uh, discussion. I think Jakub, Jakub had the question. Um, and with, with regards to the discount rates, that was another question. We're very flexible in, in the discount rate, which we were using, but up until now that the discount rate has mainly been used as a, uh, either as a, for kind of sensitivity analysis and also for presentation purposes. So if we would like to present results for, let's say the 21st century, then we, we would choose to, to discount, to use discounted values. Um, but this is not something we've gone into detail about, uh, indeed, what is the, the most appropriate discount uh, value to use. So okay. that's Thanks. it briefly. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, I think we can uh, we can uh, conclude here. Let me just uh, recall to our audience. Unfortunately, it will be an Italian, but uh, the next uh, webinar on uh, July twenty first uh, at twelve, uh, focusing on um, uh, glaciology and impacts on the. Uh, ice, uh, I, um, ice heat basically is the start in the cryosphere. Okay, uh, it, it will be the translation and the, the communication in Italian of the IPCC report on this specific topic. So, thanking everyone who was uh, and is uh, still with us. I also let me uh, thank again our speakers for the very interesting presentation and uh, see you soon. I, I think that we are going to have other coach webinars, but uh, more in the future. So after the summer break. Okay. Thank you very much again and uh, see you soon. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye.